you, Sarah, for that offertory. And how about that announcement lady, huh? She... <laughs> I do want to bring you up to uh, speed on something that occurred just this morning at first service at Kesslinger Campus. Uh, you may hear about it later. You may have heard about it already today. But a young man named Evan um, had a seizure of some sort right about during the offering time. And um, people rallied around him. Kenton paused the, the entire announcement process. Uh, the ushers called 911. And uh, he was cared for. Eventually, on his own power, was able to leave um, the building, and he's being attended to right now. So, just wanted you to know that. And I'd like to say, I'd like to pray just briefly for this young man named Evan and for his family. So, bow with me, will you? Lord, thank you for the uh, the day. Thank you for bringing us together as a church family. And we do want to lift up Evan to you. You know him. Uh, you know what happened today. We do not, but you do. Thank you for those who immediately cared for him, the ushers and other first responders, and we ask you to give peace to his family and restore him uh, soon uh, to health. Uh, and thank you for this opportunity we have here to pray for him. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you for that. Well, a couple of years ago or so, our four boys were all home. They're all in their 20s now, as many of you know. And they were all home um, for a weekend. I think it was summer, maybe spring break. And one of the things they love to do when they're all home together is play basketball in the driveway. Um, here they are. And one of the things I love to do when they're home is watch them play basketball in the driveway. So that was happening this particular Saturday morning, I think, and it was a hot day. And all that watching made me really thirsty, so uh, I went into the garage to get something cold to drink. And all I could find in our garage fridge was a can of cold root beer, which is weird because we don't have root beer that often, and I don't drink root beer that often, but that's what I found. So I took it back out onto the porch and had my root beer as I watched them play basketball, finished the root beer, and needed to take the can in and throw it away. So I took it into our kitchen, to our uh, recycle bin. And in our kitchen, the recycle bin and the regular garbage are right next to each other in the same drawer. Some of you may have setups like that. So the near one is the garbage, the far one is recycle bin. So I went to drop my can in the recycle portion, but I noticed the little white liner bag that's usually in there was missing meant somebody had already taken the bag of recycles out to the garage, but did not replace the little liner bag. So I had the decision to make. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. I could assume that whoever took it out had also checked to see if we had any more liner bags, and we did not, so it wasn't replaced. Or I could walk the two steps over to our kitchen sink and look in the cabinet to see if we actually had any of those bags or not. And so I decided. <laughs> and I dropped my can in the regular garbage. Went back out to watch basketball. Well, a few minutes later, my wife came out because she also likes to watch basketball. And when there was a stoppage in play, she said, uh, hey guys, uh, who forgot to replace the liner bag in the recycle bin? And one of them immediately went, oh, mom, that was me. I took it out. I think I forgot to put it back in. She goes, that's fine. Thanks for taking it out. The next time, remember to put the liner bag in. And then she said, holding a root beer can up in her hand, <laughs> and by the way, who dropped the can into the regular garbage? And immediately, all four boys just burst out laughing because they knew. And they had <laughs> seen me with the can, and they knew exactly what I did. I had sort of left that little chore that someone else could do. Now, we're in our summer series called The Disciplines of Grace, and we've been encouraging you and ourselves week by week to build spiritual habits into your lives. We began with the habit of gratitude, thinking of five things every day for five days in a row that you're deeply you're grateful for. Then we moved to the, the spiritual habit of noticing or attending, paying attention to what God is doing, His presence in your life. And then last week we talked about generosity. So I hope you had fun looking for ways to be secretly generous. And I think I said this a couple of weeks ago. The thing we also want you to know is you don't have to stop doing one to do another one. These are to be built on top of each other and become the rhythms and the spiritual habits of our lives. Now today we're talking about the discipline or the grace of service. And we're going to look at Philippians, which is in the New Testament. It's a, an ancient letter written by the Apostle Paul to a church in a city called Philippi. Now, if you look at this map, Philippi is uh, up there to the top, and it's in what we would call Greece. Then it was called Macedonia. And 
the church there started when Paul felt led by the Holy Spirit. You can read about this in Acts chapter 16. He felt led by the Holy Spirit to go to that part of the world. And when he gets there, he does not find a synagogue, but he finds a group of people praying together by a river. One of them is a woman named Lydia. Lydia eventually becomes a follower of Jesus and her entire household, and they're baptized, and the church in Philippi is born. And just in case you're ever playing Bible trivia, or maybe you're on Jeopardy, and the question comes up, the very first church in Europe is believed to be this church in Philippi, the Philippian church. So Paul uh, is writing from prison, some think he's in Rome, and he's writing to encourage this young church, which I think was one of his favorite churches. Um, there was a, it was a loving church, a generous church, a growing church, but there were some issues he wanted to speak to. And one of them shows up later in Philippians chapter 4. Let me read a couple of verses. It gives you a little backdrop about what Paul's thinking here. Verses 2 and 3, he says, I plead with Euodia and I plead with Syntyche, these are female names, to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, I ask you, my true companion, help these women since they have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Now, what was the issue here between these two women? We don't really know, but we can just sort of guess that maybe it was a clash of personalities. Maybe it was a sort of a power struggle between two gifted women. We don't really know, but Paul is going to speak to these issues in just a moment. Now, our text for today is Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, one of the most well-known and loved texts in the entire New Testament. Let me read it for you. Paul writes, therefore, I'm going to stop there after one word. When you see the word therefore, you should go back and kind of figure out why, why it's there or what it's there for. Um, back in chapter 1, Paul had referred to his own suffering how he was dealing with it, with joy. He's encouraging this young church when they face their own obstacles and difficulties. He says in chapter 1, verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, what does it look like to live the life of Jesus in the world? Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, and not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this is a profoundly theological text, one of the most important Christological texts in the entire New Testament, but it's also a profoundly practical text. Paul is urging these young Philippian believers, and I believe urging us today, to imitate, first of all, the humility of Christ. That's point one today, to imitate the humility of Christ. Of Christ. Some time ago I came across this little story and it reminded me a little bit of our family. A mother was making pancakes for breakfast for her two young sons. And immediately the two uh, little boys began arguing about who's going to get the first pancake because, you know, they're boys. So the mom, being a good mom, uh, sees it as an opportunity for a little teaching time, a little spiritual lesson. So she, she says, boys, boys, is that what Jesus would do? If Jesus was here, would he be arguing about getting the first pancake? And they all knew what their, they both knew what the answer was. They shook their heads. She said, no, that's right. If Jesus was here, he would let his brother have the first pancake. It's quiet at the table. After a few moments, the older brother looked at the younger brother and said, okay, you get to be Jesus today. <laughs> Sounds a little familiar. But what is humility? The word Paul uses here in this letter is a, is a long compound Greek word. I can't begin to pronounce it, but it's two words put together. One means low or lowly. The other means mind or thinking. 
So literally, low thinking, and was used to express having a, a modest view of oneself. Now, a little point of interest here is that humility was not a, a valued character trait in the ancient Roman world in which Paul was living and writing. Honor was the character trait. The, the, the goal of life was to achieve honor for yourself. And humility was seen as something associated with failure and shame. And Paul changes all that here. First, he teaches us what humility is not. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And maybe he's thinking about those two women right here. Maybe they were butting heads because they were motivated selfishly. Maybe he's thinking about himself here. Because before he was Paul the Apostle, he was Saul of Tarsus, one of the most selfishly ambitious and vain people on the face of the earth. But he says, humility is not selfish ambition or vain Conceit. The phrase selfish ambition is self-explanatory. It means being motivated uh, by self-interest, being motivated uh, for self-purposes. Selfish ambition is wanting the first pancake for yourself, just because you're you. But the, the phrase vain conceit is a little more interesting. It means literally vain glory. It means wanting glory for yourself. And I want you to see how contemporary this 2,000-year-old letter is, because we live today, I believe, in a culture of selfish ambition and vain glory. We live in a culture I like to call a red carpet culture, because we worship celebrity in all its forms. Like, imagine you're watching a TV show like the Oscars, or maybe you're watching the Country Music Awards. I don't know, is it just me, or are they on like every two weeks, the Country Music Awards? Or a show like the NBA Awards show, which is on last week. My son and I watched that. What do you see in common in all those photos? Red carpet, right? Well, first, there's celebrities, way more famous than you and I are ever going to be. And they're all wealthy, way beyond our imagination. And then there's the red carpet. We live in a red carpet culture. And I think this spills over sometimes even into the social media world. I don't know how many of you ever check out, you know, Facebook or Instagram or any of this other stuff, but, and I think, I don't mean to step on toes, and I don't, I don't think people are intentional about this, but sometimes when I look at those things, the whole thing seems to be about, hey, look at me. Look at what I get to do. Look at where I am. Look what I'm eating. Look what my kids are doing. You see what I mean? We live in a culture of selfish ambition, being glory. We live in a culture of of that, that, that emphasizes upward mobility. Know your rights. Get what you deserve. But humility, Paul says, is not that. It's not selfish ambition. Next, Paul teaches us what humility is. He says, in humility, value others above yourself. Now, it's important to see here that humility is not devaluing yourself. It's not saying, well, I'm worthless. I'm no good at anything. I'm nothing. I'm a nobody. No, that's not what he means. It's not devaluing yourself, it's valuing others above yourself. So humility is saying, yeah, I'm hungry, I'm going to have a pancake this morning, but you can have the first one. It's a different thing. Or let's say it's after breakfast, you're on your way to work, and it's a, it's a busy day, traffic's bad, it's hot, you're running late, and there's some guy going up the shoulder trying to get to the front of the line. You know, there's always that guy in traffic doing that. What's your instinct? Oh, no, not you, buddy. Hey, don't let that guy get in. I hate that. <laughs> Going to cost you five seconds on the way to work, right? We all have that instinct of self-interest. Interestingly, I was, came across an article um, online by Forbes magazine. I don't usually read articles by Forbes, but I happened to see this one, and it was entitled, Effective Leaders Choose Humility Over Hubris. Now, hubris is a fancy word for pride. Secular magazine, secular article. Here's what the article said. Leaders tainted by hubris give life to toxic environments, workplaces where incivility and downright hostility often flourish. But leaders who choose humility, who model humbleness in their actions, create the opposite kind of environment. And they create outcomes that are mutually beneficial for the firm and for the individual. I read that and I thought, hmm. Seems to me the Apostle Paul was writing about that 2,000 years ago the church in Philippi. Humility is not looking to your own interests, not searching for your own honor, but looking for the interests of others. It sounds simple, doesn't it? 
It sounds easy, but it's profoundly countercultural and it's profoundly unnatural because it demands that we also imitate what I'm calling today the emptying of Christ. That's the second point, the emptying of Christ. Now, what does that mean? Well, a long time ago, um, before I was married, I was working as a part-time basketball coach at Taylor University in Indiana, sort of central Indiana, and I had to drive to South Bend one night to see a ball game, scout a player or something. And I was driving back south from South Bend to central Indiana after the game and all that. It was late at night, uh, maybe 1130 at night. It was middle of the winter, dark, extremely cold, like 15, 20 below zero, and uh, a blizzard developed, just a, a raging snowstorm. Oh, nearly whiteout conditions. So I'm driving along in my car, and if you've ever been, been driving in Indiana, maybe even southern uh, Illinois, out in the farmland, there's nothing to stop the wind from blowing snow across the road. And I hit a patch of snow that was across the highway. It was about a foot deep, like 10 feet long. And I hit that snow, and my car came right up off the, off the pavement and skidded sideways and slid into a snowbank um, on the side of the road. I'm stuck. Wheels off the road wouldn't go anywhere, way before anybody ever thought of a cell phone. I had no phone, no way to communicate. I hadn't seen a car on the road in about an hour because it was so late and so cold and so bad. And the fleeting thought, thought crossed my mind, I could freeze to death in my car on the side of the road in central Indiana. I don't remember if I prayed. I probably should have. I don't remember. But within, well, that thought's still in my mind. Just, not, just minutes after I came to a stop, wondering what I was going to do, this giant pickup truck, I mean, big pickup truck, giant tires, gun rack in the back, comes rumbling by me and stops like 15 feet in front of my car, right on the side of the road. And this enormous man gets out of the truck. I mean, a big guy, giant beard. I'm not making this up. He jumped out, giant beard, comes walking right over my window. I'm like... <laughs> he motions for me to roll my window down. I roll it down like an inch. <laughs> I'm the one stuck. He goes... Put it in neutral. Okay, put it in neutral. He goes back to his truck. He pulls out a chain, this giant metal chain with a grappling hook on the end of it, crawls underneath my car, burrows into the snow. I can hear him rummaging around under my car, banging on the bottom of my car, hooks the hook on, crawls back out again. Snow is covering his face, his beard, everything. Goes to his truck. He's got like a power winch or something. Cranks that thing up, and it drags my car out of the snowbank right back on the road in like 15 seconds. Comes back, climbs under my car again, unhooks it, comes back out, and he's standing at my window. I'm thinking, well, I, I probably should pay him. So I, I reached in my pocket, rolled down my window this time, and said, hey, thanks. And he goes, nah, just do something nice for somebody someday. Gets back in his truck and drives away. Never even got his name. But I never forgot what he did. He did what he didn't have to do for someone he didn't know and got nothing in return. That's what we see here in Philippians, verse 5, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, many New Testament scholars, maybe most, believe this is actually a hymn sung in the early church. One of the earliest worship songs sung by believers was this, these four verses right here. And it's full of theological meaning. Let me go through sort of line by line. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. The word mindset is a combination of an internal conviction that produces an outward action. In other words, think and act like Jesus, he says. Then who being in very nature God, I'm going to stop there. This is an astonishing statement. We kind of get used to talking like that as believers here in church. He says, Jesus being in very nature God, this is what sets Christianity apart from every other major world religion. Jesus didn't teach about God. He was and is God. Not only is he God, but he did not consider equality with God something to be used for his advantage. Now, we live in a world where advantage matters, position matters, titles matter, achievements matter. We're all taught very young in life to find where we fit in the pecking order of importance, right? Remember choosing up sides and recess in elementary school? Remember that brutal process? 
You found out pretty quickly where you stacked up, and you just didn't want to be that last guy chosen. And we learned that life is about fighting and scratching and clawing to climb up the ladder to become more important. Here Paul says, as we're busy climbing up the ladder, Jesus climbs by us going down the ladder. Jesus had the right to ultimate position, ultimate privilege, and he didn't use it for his advantage. Rather, Paul says, he made himself nothing. The Greek word literally is he emptied himself. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, that is, he emptied himself of position and power and privilege to take the outward shape, form of a servant. And the word there is usually translated slave. Now, this is some heavy stuff. And if we don't get this, if we don't understand what he's saying, the gospel itself doesn't make any sense. It's meaningless. Paul wants to make it very clear that Jesus wasn't just another guy. He wasn't another prophet. He wasn't another religious teacher. He was and is God. And this is the uniqueness of our faith. God, in the flesh, in the form of Jesus came here, lived with us. And then, verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we are used to this as well. We have crosses we look at. We wear them around our necks. But in the ancient Roman world, that last phrase, death on a cross, would have been almost unimaginably offensive to the people who first read this because they knew what the cross was. And anyone who died on one of those had to be a criminal, had to be worthless as a human being, had to be a complete nobody. And yet Paul says, Jesus, the one who had ultimate position and privilege, surrendered all that, became obedient, a servant, and died on one of those, a cross. Now why does that matter? Well, because without the cross... There is no forgiveness because there's no atonement made for your sin or my sin. Without the cross, there's no resurrection because you need a dead body to be resurrected. Without the cross, there is no gospel at all. There is no good news. There is no hope. We're just wasting our time. And what does it mean for us? It means not only did Jesus go to the cross to give us the great gift of his salvation, that's what we mean by experience grace, he also gave us an example, an example to follow. Because servanthood is emptying yourself of place, position, privilege, pride, expectations, need for recognition. In other words, where our culture teaches us to climb up the ladder, Jesus is teaching us how to climb down the ladder. I was in an airport recently, traveling with my wife, and I noticed something I think is in every airport in America, probably, we just don't notice it, but I, this day, walking through that terminal, I noticed. We, in fact, we both noticed at the same time. It was one of those shoe shine stations. You know what I'm talking about? In airports? And there was a guy sitting up on a chair, up kind of high, and there was another guy shining his shoes in public. You know, people are just walking by. And we both just looked and said, really? We, we, this is 2019, we still do that? And I find myself wanting, I didn't want to be either guy. I didn't want to be the guy sitting up on the chair having my shoe shined. I mean, how embarrassing is that? I didn't want to be the guy down there shining the shoe. That's worse. And then I thought of something this week. A story in John chapter 17 at the Last Supper when Jesus did what? He washed the feet of his disciples. He chose to be that guy. So often I think we find ourselves saying, you know, that's not my job. It's outside my job description. That's, a, that's, that's beneath me. Somebody should do that, but not me. And I wonder, ask myself, what is it, what do I hold on to that keeps me from humility? What do I hold on to that keeps me from that downward mobility? That keeps me from obedient service? Is it pride sometimes? Is it fear? Is it just sheer busyness? Don't have time for that. Servanthood begins with humility. Humility demands that we empty ourselves, and then servanthood produces, thirdly, 
the exaltation of Christ. That's the third thing today, the exaltation of Christ. Verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, let's be honest, at least I want to be honest, I don't want to put it on you but me. When I, when I serve, when I do something, I like to get credit for it. Do you? You know, when I empty the dishwasher or when I take the recycle bag out or when I put salt in the water softener, I hate that job. But when I do that, I, I, I kind of want a little parade, just a small one, a little parade. Have you ever heard of something called a humble brag? Do you know what a humble brag is? It's, uh, it's when people post something or do something, it's kind of a subtle way of patting yourself on the back. I found a couple of these on Twitter. I don't know if you follow Twitter or not, but I found a couple of these. Look at the first one. I just did something very selfless, but more importantly, it was genuine, and I know it means a lot to the person in the long run. Hashtag so worth it. <laughs> See, that, that's a humble brag. How about this one? I'm truly humbled that you follow my tweets. I pray they enrich your life and strengthen your ministry. God bless all 200,000 of you. <laughs> that's actually a pastor. That's my favorite one. Now, why do these hit us as funny? even a little bit pathetic maybe. It's because they're not really humble, are they? That's a very subtle form of vain glory. And yet, Jesus did teach us that humility, service, downward mobility does result in exaltation. Matthew chapter 20, teaching the disciples. He said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Power, position, upward mobility. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus says, you want to be great? Good. You want to be significant? Wonderful. Here's how. Learn how to climb down the ladder. Here's the thing. When we do that as his followers, when we live like that, we actually participate in the exaltation of Jesus. Did you see what Paul said here? He's giving us a glimpse into the culmination of all things. He's sort of giving us a glimpse at the last chapter of the book or the last scene in the movie. Did you see it? Here it is again. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's saying the day is coming when Jesus will take his rightful place as king of all things, king of the universe, king of heaven, king of heaven and earth. It's his. And every creature on under the earth, who's ever lived, every creature will bow before him, willingly or unwillingly, they will bow. That's what Paul says. And we have a chance to share in that moment now, he says. My brother Joe is a pastor in Ohio, Hudson, uh, now it's called Christ Community Chapel in Hudson, Ohio. A wonderful church, and they, their church picks themes every year. We pick themes sometimes, but their theme this year is make Jesus famous. Make Jesus famous. So I was visiting my folks who live with my brother uh, a couple of weeks ago. We were sitting around talking about their church, and I happened to be wearing this T-shirt. Remember these from last summer? The church has left the building. I was wearing this T-shirt, and someone in the family looked at my T-shirt, I think it was my mom, and said, sort of, sort of quizzing, Quizzically, is that a word, quizzically, sort of, the church has left the building? Like, what does that mean? And my brother's grandson, Connor, seven years old about, was walking by, and he, heard, he overheard the conversation. Like, what does that mean? He looked at my shirt, he turned his head a little bit, and he went, oh, that's easy. He said, the people aren't in the church anymore, they're out doing stuff. I said, Connor, you got it. And that's how we make Jesus famous. Not in here, out there. When 
Dozens and dozens of adults and students give a week of their lives to serve children. 500 children at Kessinger Campus at VBS. Jesus is exalted. When 100 people serve one Saturday a month at Buddy Break. So families with special needs kids get a break. Jesus is exalted. When 1,000 of us or 2,000 of us sign up for a serving day in August to make our community a better place just because we follow Jesus, he's exalted. When we empty ourselves, when we serve, we make Jesus famous. And the world gets a glimpse of the exalted Christ. We have a challenge every week in this series, something simple to keep in your minds as we go through the week. And the one for this week is pretty simple. Serve somewhere. Serve somewhere. Serve someone Maybe it means sign up on your app or the little card to be part of our serving day. Maybe, that, maybe that's it for you. It doesn't have to be, but maybe it is. Or maybe it's noticing something right where you live, maybe in your home, maybe on your street, maybe where you work, and you notice something that your first, well, your first reaction is, uh, somebody really should do something about that. Uh, 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 not me. I mean, that's beneath me. Somebody ought to do that. You know, one morning you notice your neighbor's garbage is tipped over in the wind at night and the stuff's laying all over the road. You know, somebody really ought to do something about that. I wonder when they're coming by to pick that up. Notice something and then empty yourself. Humble yourself. Climb down the ladder and make Jesus famous. That's our call as a church. Let's make Jesus famous. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you for your word. And I thank you for this ancient letter, this insight into who you are and what you did that so profoundly shapes who we are and how we are to live. Teach us the grace of downward mobility. Teach us the grace of servanthood so that we may make your name famous. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.